Thank you very much for coming, Sandy. We are here in the last Calder Gallery. Um, after three years of a fruitful and uh, very fascinating cooperation, this will be the last Calder Gallery in the Fondation Bayer, by the way, or by the time. And well, we'll see. We'll see, yeah. <laughs> It announces also the next big cold exhibition at yeah. the Fondation Bayler um, in 2016. So it's also the, a kind of beginning of something new in a way. And, uh, so but, that's a, that, but that's a secret still, our project for next year. Actually, it's not... Um, Has it been announced? Yeah, oh, more or okay. less, but we, we, can, we can see this later, okay. but um, I think it, it has been announced already. Okay. So, um, and this last call, the gallery uh, is uh, dedicated to the early abstract paintings of Caldo, which are really crucial also in the evolution, I think, of Caldo's work. They are announcing his uh, abstract language, so also his uh, early abstract sculptures. Uh, namely the mobiles, but also some of the wire, uh, abstract wire sculptures and even the, the motorized uh, panels in a way. So, um, and I think the idea was really also to present the, um, the paintings in a direct dialogue with, uh, with his uh, sculptures, really to see um, the very evident and interesting um, in influen influence of uh, his painting to his sculptures. Um, Sandy, do you think, um, I mean, the sculptures have been made in Paris, the, the early sculptures, abstract sculptures, but also the paintings. And what do you think, what was um, the impact of this, um, this stay uh, in Europe, called the stay in Europe? Was it? Uh, really influential also in the discovery of uh, called this abstract language or do you think that it would, could have been happened also in the United States? I think these paintings um, are a very great definition to your question because uh, most curators chose these paintings. These paintings are from October 1930. For two weeks he paints 19 paintings. And um, most curators choose ones that remind you of Mondrian or De Stille, like this one exactly. over there, um, which is it's kind of a misconception because there are so many different styles. There's one that's sort of like Kandinsky with objects sort of defining uh, movement of musical sound through space and things like that. These two paintings are much more American abstraction, like this one's very much like Arthur Dove. So there are all these different styles going on in this brief moment of two-dimensional abstraction, his first abstractions really. So um, it's, it's a moment of sort of, uh, he's reconsidering his history, mm -hmm. his history as an American and American abstraction and um, his ideas about how to present a composition as influenced by um, de Stiel, but also you can see other things going on in these paintings. Exactly. Beyond, beyond the seven here, the rest of the, uh, the other dozen paintings um, have other stories going mm. on too. There you can see um, the influence, the indirect influence from the constructivists. You see these black forms in space, these dynamic black forms. Um, so there's a lot going on. Yeah, absolutely. But uh, actually that was also the idea to present um, Caldo really also as a very original painter, not just as a painter who is just um, imitating other other artists like Mondrian, of course, the, op the, the yeah. influence is there, but I think, and that's, that's very interesting also to see the way he is also mixing or bringing together different inspirations in his very own um, language, um, actually. But then, um, however, I think um, the, the discovery of Mondrian's uh, studio in Paris was, of course, groundbreaking also in his, uh, in his view um, or in his mm -hmm. understanding of abstraction. But we always have to put that in, in precise definition because when you say that, people think it's the paintings and the works of art of Mondrian that had this influence on Calder visiting the studio. And that's not what happened because he already knew the paintings mm -hmm. very, very well. He knew Mondrian, he knew the paintings, he knew the vocabulary yeah. of Mondrian. So when he walks into the studio, it's not the paintings that have this shock. Mm -hmm. His word is a shock. It's this five-sided room with cross light coming in and then these rectangles for re recompositionable experimentation, these colored rectangles, right? Squares, rectangles. 
and it was that every object in the space had rigorous definition, almost mathematical definition, mm -hmm. had a purpose in its existence in the, in the volume. Seeing it as a work of art, Calder saw it as a work of art. Mondrian didn't intend his studio as a work of art. He intended it as a sublime space. But Calder's response was, this is a work of art. And that was really surprising that the whole volume had, it was a presentation. Yeah. And then the idea, then the second thing was he suggested to Mondrian that these, uh, these cardboard, colored cardboard should be made to oscillate in motion, <laughs> which Mondrian thought was a terrible idea. Um, and then Calder continued to work on that idea. So right yeah. after that, he became fully abstract. Mm -hmm. He was pushed fully into abstraction and made those 19 paintings, which are, you've done an amazing job bringing them together with three, uh, uh, an abstraction from 31 and two from 34 that have a reference to these paintings. You can see the continuation of the ideas breaking right. off the canvas into the three-dimensional works and in motion. Um, even the one back there, Quasier, has vibratory motion, even though it's not a literal mobile like this one, um, it vibrates and it... Yeah, and it a precarious it, balance also. It's super precarious yeah. and it resonates this kind of energy coming out of it that is like a mobile. But you so. think that the paintings, the early abstract paintings for Caldo were really, a, how to say, a point of departure or the first field where he could um, make first experiments in this, um, in this uh, abstract language? But I think it's, that's, it's quite unique also in art history that um, a painter, um, in a way, starts with, um, or not a painter, a sculpture and a painter, starts um, through painting to discover then what will become so typical and characteristic for, for his sculpture, so namely the abstract sculpture. Um, do you think that um, Calder was considering very much himself still as a painter that time? Or what was the meaning of, of painting um, in, in 1930 when he made these, these early abstract paintings? I mean, was he well, still in, in this? Was it still a, a period of transition from, I mean, f between painting or sculpture? Was he still considering himself as a painter also, or that was something that I was asking myself very often? I mean, almost every great artist works in multiple mediums. You s you have to see the photographs of Ellsworth Kelly, for instance, to see its source material. But they're beautiful images, mm -hmm. um, you know or people that break out into sculpture that are known as painters and all that kind of thing. For my grandfather, he used different mediums as a way to explore a new direction. Mm -hmm. so he didn't go straight. He went this way to painting and then back to sculpture or work in drawing or even in jewelry mm -hmm. and all, yeah, the, right. all the different mediums that he worked in. That's why when BMW came to him in, in 1975 and said, will you paint a motor car? Yeah. He said, sure. It wasn't... It he wasn't was open. Yeah, it wasn't an exotic... He was, you know, he's... Uh, at the time, he was 76, 77 years old, mm -hmm. and it wasn't, it wasn't a strange idea to try something else, try a new medium, you know? That's interesting. But um, what, is, what is also um, interesting, and I think that we, we have some very uh, characteristic examples to see that um, he was really also um, in search of a translation, a way of painting, painting aspects into sculpture. For instance, we have the, the wonderful sculpture Black Frame, which is a kind of transposition of painting into sculpture, into also a kinetic sculpture. So do you think that the, the, um, this painterly dimension is always in a way present in his sculptures? Namely, I, w I was also thinking about the, the, the importance of color, because I think Calder said that color wasn't important for his sculpture at all. And actually, I'm, I'm not so sure if this is true, because I think that everything is perfectly balanced. Also, if you see this sculpture, for instance, the yellow with the, with the red, the, the black and white, it really also has this connection also to, to these uh, paintings. Do you think that, in general, there's a painting dimension in his sculpture? Or well, when he said the color was less significant, he was talking about really monumental, grand sculptor, sculptures. So um, there were occasions where he intended something to be black, but in the end he made it red. Okay. Um, you know, just shifted because of how it was going to be utilized, mm -hmm. meaning it's how it was installed, right? Mm -hmm. He thought of them as utilization, though, the installation of monumental sculpture. Okay. So that's, that was what he was referencing. He didn't mean these sculptures that 
I mean, this okay. all in black would be an entirely different thing, and Absolutely. the color is, is a significant factor. Um, it's great, though, if you look at the exhibition, because you see um, something beyond what's expected in Calder's palette. These weird greens, grays, browns, all these secondary colors beyond the primaries. Um, this funny thing, it looks like a Richard Serra sculpture. That's true. This, 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 yeah, uh, the curves. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's really, I mean, it's not a landscape, it's a non objective composition, but we start to, you know, define things or find meaning in them, but it's just amusing. But even in some uh, paintings you have, in a way, for instance, we have the, a little painting that reminds a little bit also of conceptions by uh, Kandinsky. This is what he's uh, actually treating also in his uh, theory book, uh, Punkt zu Linie, uh, zu Fläche. Yeah. And um, so in some paintings you even have the, a bit the impression that he's even also thinking about sound, about sound qualities also, and tries to translate that this in a kind of very uh, yeah, simple, um, reduced way through painting. Yeah. So I think he's really reflecting about different aspects that, that then will also become crucial in his, in his sculptures. It's funny because sound uh, appears in Calder's sculptures um, all throughout his career. This work of 1934 is actually a sound-making work. Um, the objects collide and it makes a composition of tonalities, an open composition of tonalities, yeah. which is a very exotic idea in 1934. I mean, his great friend Edgar Varese loved Calder sculptures, but hated the musical things. He thought mm -hmm. this was not music. Um, even Varese, who was so forward-looking, thought that this yeah, was interesting. strange. Um, but the sound quality is very interesting. That you, that you have a visual representation of sound. That's exactly. how we both read that. I mean, yeah. who knows what Calder intended, but we both see that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and then there's the actuality of sound and the actuality of motion instead of the implication of motion. Mm -hmm. um, so in the futurists, you know, they wanted to see the back side of the sculpture and the front side at the same, from one position, the same moment, and Calder resolves that by seeing through the sculpture, mm -hmm. see the back, see the front. But he does um, this literal presentation of motion in a mobile is, you know, so many people were attacking the question of how do you represent motion and time mm -hmm. in a, you know, a sequential based image in a painting. And Calder does it, does it in a literal fashion, he just has it move. Yeah. And that irritated people because it was almost like he was cheating. He went around the question instead of through the question. And same with the musical works, because they literally make sound instead of some sort of emotional depiction mm -hmm. of how you feel when you hear Stravinsky. You know? Yeah, no, that's, that's true. So it's, it's, um, he's funny that way and, and irritating when he invented wire sculpture, the figure of wire sculpture, mm -hmm. very upsetting to people, there's no mass, and then irritated them again by making actual little emotion, yeah. and then irritated them again by making sound and so on. So he was quite irritable. Yeah, that's to, yeah, to the establishment. Absolutely, you know. and revolutionary, of course. Yeah. Um, and just another question. Um, the, um, the most, most of, the, um, of the paintings are still in the, in the Calder Foundation. Um, so I think just a few are in other collections. Yeah. Um, is, what's the reason? Was it something that Calder didn't want to sell? Was it so important to him that he wanted to keep them? Or is there, is there a reason why they are so, still so concentrated in the, uh, in, in the succession of, of, of Calder? Most of my grandfather's commercial exhibitions were, you know, the works are chosen by the dealer. Yeah. So um, there are some exceptions to that. I mean, the first show of abstraction, which had that sculpture in mm -hmm, it mm -hmm. in 1931, um, the dealer insisted that he include the figurative wire sculptures because he was very famous at that time of for course. them. So all those portraits, you know the photograph, of all those portraits up near the ceiling in figuration, portraits of Leger and Kiki de Montparnasse and Aux Enfants, all those people, all these great people. And then the abstractions below, because that was the shift that was confusing. Mm -hmm. So um, I suppose one, the dealers weren't interested in trying to sell these paintings when you could offer the sculptures. Okay. And also, they just, they were a moment. It mm -hmm. was very brief. Yeah, of course. It's two weeks, two weeks of activity, yeah, yeah. so, and then they were just, were stored, you know. But for Calder, they were, they had an importance also. I mean, 
did he was he aware of really this um, you know this this crucial moment also that yeah. happened in the in this in the time in the, in the two weeks that he was painting yeah. these works. He did exhibit some of these paintings, um, but later. So in the okay. Guggenheim in 1964, in his big show, is really when he represented more of them than anywhere else. And that was also at the Musée del Madame. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. so they did have exposure, but they weren't shown by Sweeney at, at the MoMA 1943 okay. show. They weren't all. chosen. Okay. So. Um, so it had to do also with the curators and the, the art market yeah, in a way, yeah. the dealers. Of but I think, I think at the Guggenheim in 64, he himself was considering his history and he chose those paintings to include in the exhibition okay. as to show something about the evolution. Um, it was really his choice, not, not Tom Messer who was curating it at the time. Yeah, okay, wonderful. So um, thank you very much, it's Sandy. Great. It was really I'm, great I'm, to see I you again. I love the gallery. Thank you for, for your support and uh, yeah, I'm happy that you, you like it.